entirely the computational use of these processors and try to give you a feeling for kind of how close we think these are to simulating condensed, being able to simulate condensed matter systems, as well as how we might go about doing that. So this is, I think, going to be one of only two photos of actual hardware in this entire talk. And so I'd just like to remind you, this is, you know, real physical stuff at the lab. And, um, you know, let's all bask in the glory of hardware for a moment. Experimentalist, by the way. So, oh, great. Now the arrow keys aren't working either. There we go. Um, I am going to take a moment. I think I'm the only industrial physicist in the room here just to kind of tell you what that means. Um, I'm part of IBM Research. We're a group of about 3,000 researchers studying everything from computer science to physics to chemistry to polymer science. Uh, we're really interested in things that affect computation. So we're really interested in next node CMOS, quantum computing, artificial intelligence. If you work there for long enough, you can also eventually say the words hybrid cloud middleware without, <laughs> almost without laughing, um, but it's an acquired skill. Uh, we have approximately 13 sites scattered throughout the world, including one in Dublin and Warrington, you know, kind of local to here. Although about half of all the researchers are located, wow, that's really dark on the screen are located in our research headquarters in Yorktown Heights, New York, which is also where I'm from. Um, just to show a couple of the sites, the one in the top left is that Yorktown Heights site I mentioned. That's where we build all of our quantum hardware and we do the vast majority of the testing. The other one that's very near to my heart is that Albany site down in the bottom left. That's a joint research facility between IBM and semiconductor manufacturing companies. We do things like work on two nanometer node CMOS. And the why, reason why I love that is the fact that people can go back and forth between these sites and help each other is a large part of the reason why we can do the things that we do. So since we've been talking a little bit about the history of quantum mechanics, I thought I'd just go ahead and throw this slide in as a little bit of motivation that, you know, this top left is Dirac talking about quantum mechanics and saying, you know, the equations are completely known, well, he thought at the time, um, but the application of them to real, hard, real problems is just entirely too hard or too complicated. And so we need to work on approximate practicable methods. And I think everyone in this room is aware of a lot of the approximate practical methods that have been developed since then. Um, Feynman took a little bit different viewpoint on it though. You know, he's not happy with all the analysis that goes with some of these approximate methods and classical theories. That if you wanna simulate nature, that you really should just use a quantum mechanical system to do it. And he says that was kind of his usual charm. And so we generally credit with, with being the person that kicked off the idea of building quantum computers. Um, from a computational viewpoint, this is kind of a really silly picture of a quantum computer. You have a problem that you want to solve. You have to have a classical algorithm that will map that into a circuit. We'll talk about what a circuit is in a moment. You see a polynomial amount of data into your quantum computer. You get a polynomial amount of data out, and hopefully that gives you the solution. Today, we're really going to be focused heavily on the circuit, and so I'm going to spend a moment talking about it. Uh, each one of these horizontal lines represents a qubit. So think of it as a single two-level system. Think of it as equivalent to an electron spin. Each one of those boxes is a unitary operation on that qubit. Uh, for example, this might be a poly sigma X, a poly sigma Y matrix. It might be a Hadamard, which basically swaps the Y and the Z axis. There's this entire weird language to describe unitary matrices that shows up in quantum computing. You notice most of these are local to just one qubit, and that's because in practice, most of the controls in these computers are local to a single qubit. But there are also some two qubit gates. This is drawn with something called a C naught gate, which is just a gate that will flip one qubit depending on the Z projection of the other. Um, different quantum computers use different sets of basis gates. For example, a C phase gate, which looks like a ZZ interaction where the frequency of one qubit depends on the state of another is quite common. You can map all these condensed matter terms. The C naught term, the gate looks a lot like an exchange uh, term. The ZZ term looks a lot like a dispersive coupling. These two qubit gates are typically local to the geometry of the qubits on the chip because these are real physical things. And so you're somewhat constrained in the circuits that you can run on an actual um, quantum computer. But in practice, you always try to pick a universal set of gates so that you can de decompose an arbitrary n qubit unitary into a short circuit in the set of gates that you're using. So at this point, we can forget about all of the details of those gates and just think of this as a mach machine where we start out with a state vector. I can forget about the fact that those are even individual electron spins, and I'm just going to think of those as components in a state vector. I can run an arbitrary unitary transformation on that state vector. And at the end of the day, I can measure some project set of projectors on it. And so that's really the basis of every quantum algorithm that we have. 
And I hope that's reasonably clear. Excellent. I, I have no idea how much background anyone here has on quantum information science. So if you get too bored, just throw something at me. Okay, so let's start out with an example of a very specific quantum algorithm. Uh, and I've chosen, yes. Is the quantum circuit model the most used model of this So there are a lot of models of computation. There is a adiabatic quantum computation where you start with the ground state of one Hamiltonian and then slowly transform it into another. There's measurement-based computing, which Osman again alluded to briefly the other day. Um, there's a circuit model. There's fusion-based quantum computing. There's a lot of them. They're all computationally equivalent. Um, there is actually a slight, um, I almost put this slide in here. Uh, there's actually a slight extension of the circuit model where you allow mid-circuit measurement of one of the qubits and then act in the future on the basis of that measurement, which actually makes all of those other models completely equivalent. You can represent them all in the circuit model, which is kind of a neat trick. Um, it's also interesting to note, um, unlike what we heard on Monday, these we actually do support mid-circuit measurement on these devices. So you, you can actually execute that model. Um, I should mention also that computationally equivalent is not necessarily the same thing as practically equivalent. Um, in general, for example, if I want to run an arbitrary n qubit, it's called a Clifford circuit. Uh, it's not a big red dog. It's a circuit that consists entirely of right angle rotations. If I want to run an arbitrary n qubit cir Clifford circuit on a device like this, it usually takes n layers of gates. If I allow it in mid circuit, allow mid circuit measurement and feed forward on that basis, I can actually do it in constant depth. So it can be a very big practical difference uh, as far as how these things map, but kind of in the computational sense of are they polynomially equivalent? They're all the same. Okay. All right. Variational quantum eigenvalue. Um, this is not necessarily my favorite quantum algorithm. I just think it's kind of a fun one to kick things off with because it's fairly easy to understand. Um, the idea here is to mix quantum and classical computation in a way that is kind of advantageous in the short term. And what we're going to do is start out by taking our, our um, Hamiltonian, which is Hermitian, and we can map that actually onto a poly circuit. Uh, that's kind of well known. You can automate it. And what that means is I can construct a quantum circuit where given an input state, remember, we're forgetting about those spin one halves. We're now just thinking about the state vector. I can actually compute the energy of that state as one of the observables of my system. Okay. And so what we're going to do is construct a circuit that consists of two layers. The first layer is going to be parameterized, and we're going to use it to generate an arbitrary state, you know, some based on that parameterization inside of our state space. For example, maybe my state vector are some molecular orbitals of the chemical that I'm interested in, and the Hamiltonian is in the Hamiltonian that you can compute that connect this, those molecular orbitals together. I use my quantum computer to compute the energy. And then I'll feed that into a classical computer. We'll basically do gradient descent. So the classical computer is going to optimize those variational parameters. The quantum computer is going to compute the energies for me. If I have a problem where it's computationally difficult to evaluate the energy of my trial states, then this may be advantageous. There is no proof that this type of approach has a computational advantage because you know, when you throw in the words variational, you know immediately you're kind of choosing for an approximate set of states anyway. So of course you can do that badly. And there's a great question as to whether or not gradient descent will actually do a good job of optimizing states like this. But nonetheless, this is one of the areas that people are kind of excited about near-term advantage because you might hope it will be a little bit resilient against noise. And in fact, if you look at a lot of the papers that were written sort of on doing computation with quantum computers, most of these are from sort of 2017, 2018, 2019. They're based around these variational quantum eigen solvers. You can see really exciting problems here, like finding the ground state energy of lithium hydride or looking at some excited states of some molecules. If you look a little bit more closely though, you'll see something here, four qubits, two qubits, four qubits, I think this one is three qubits. These are all being done with ridiculously small quantum systems. Um, there is no chance of getting computational advantage on something with three or four qubits. This is something you could do with a pen and paper or a pocket calculator. This is not real computation. Um, the reason why they're doing that comes down to the physical implementation of the qubits. Um, ours in particular, I just wanted to throw this in there. Again, this is the second hardware slide to remind you we're dealing with real qubits are based off of transmon qubits. These consist of uh, superconducting capacitors that are shunted with a Josephson junction. 
if you make them in the right limit where the Josephson energy is really big compared to the capacitive energy, you can just think of that Josephson junction as a nonlinear inductor. And so you get a very, very slightly um, nonlinear LC oscillator, basically. Uh, you can map this into a duffing oscillator. The non and harmonicity lets you use this thing as a qubit. Let me couple together networks of them. So our quantum states, our qubits, are microwave photons inside of these LC oscillators. Anything that gives rise to microwave decay, so anything that has any microwave loss tangent whatsoever, will cause our qubits to decay. We typically get T1s of a couple of hundred microseconds out of these guys. So we have pretty appreciable error rates. Now, the exact story on where these errors come from are different for every type of quantum computer that you want to talk about. People working in trapped ions like to talk about the fact that they're Qubits are atoms, they're excited state, or their one state is like the excited state of an atom. It has an effectively infinite T1. Their errors come mostly from errors in their uh, laser, sorry, force of habit control fields and pointing errors and that kind of thing. But all of these systems have appreciable error rates. Let's skip that because I promised only one hardware slide. Okay, so how does this play out in practice? Like, let's talk about this Eagle processor in particular, it has 127 qubits. That little plot at the top left is just showing you how the qubits are connected. So little red dots are qubits and little bars indicate places where we allow two qubit gates. It's a pretty light connectivity. So there's a, turns out to be 144 two qubit gates on that chip. If we imagine trying to run a depth 10 circuit, which is about what you would want if you're trying to do one of these VQE problems. Uh, we're talking about, uh, about 1,442 qubit gates. Optimistically, our two qubit gate fidelity is maybe 99.5%. And so if we ask what the fidelity of running the circuit is, and we just approximate that by 99.5% to the 1,440th power, you get about seven times 10 to the minus four. So about one time in a thousand, this chip would emit the right answer if you were asking it to do this tiny circuit. That's why these early VQE demos, when the error rates were even higher than they are today, we're looking at such tiny circuits with just four qubits because the error rate simply did not allow them to do more. Yes? Uh, Stephen, question. What was the definition of depth of two qubit gates? Ah, that is a great question. So I apologize for that. Um, a lot of the time when we're talking about the complexity of a circuit, we'll talk about the width, which confusingly I have the vertical axis here, which is the number of qubits, and the depth, which is the number of layers of two qubit gates. Um, in many instances, you can commute these gates around each other or you can run them simultaneously. And so calculating the depth is actually a little bit complicated. But, you know, for example, this circuit would have a depth of three because I can't commute these gates through each other because they have to have the same qubit. Obviously, two, two gates fidelity will determine how many depths you will have. And when you say 10, and then you have fidelity of 99.5, some of those things. Uh, is there any threshold that you will put that those depths is going to reasonably uh, trustworthy? That is a wonderful question, and that's essentially what the rest of this talk was about. Um, for the people on Zoom, the question was, with any given gate fidelity, can you say there's some threshold and depth beyond which you just can't trust the computation? Yes, but we can actually play with it quite a lot. <laughs> And it's a lot higher than you might naively guess from a calculation like this. So, yeah. So, a single qubit is the reason of the same as one qubit? Yeah, the bristlecone processor is based off of similar transmon qubits. Um, there is a small difference that we typically make what's called a fixed frequency transmon. So, it's exactly what I described a capacitor and a Josephson junction which means the qubit has a frequency which we determine at the time that we fabricate the chip. We have no ability to change it thereafter. Um, Google's processors typically put a squid loop there instead of that single Josephson junction, and so you can use magnetic fields to change the qubit frequencies. It gives you a processor that's a lot more flexible, but the presence of magnetic noise in that squid loop reduces the coherence time of the qubits, so it's a trade-off. Yeah. It's kind of come up to the qubit frequency. Uh, you could actually choose that by choosing the asymmetry. You can make the junctions in the squid loop symmetric or as symmetric as you can, in which case you can tune it down to very nearly zero frequency. Yeah, um, but typically you'll deliberately make them a little bit asymmetric to limit the degree of tunability to limit your sensitivity to flux noise. Yes? With regard to these uh, two cubic gates, can they be applied to any sets of two or is that a limited range of which two cubic 
Um, most devices have limited connectivity. So in the case of this device, again, the red dots are the qubits and the little bars are showing you where you can run the two qubit gates. There are exceptions to that. For example, we were hearing about Quantinium's trapped ion processors early in the week. Uh, those provide effectively all-to-all -all connectivity. Um, there's some trade-offs inherent there. If you have all-to-all -all connectivity, you typically have limited parallelism of your gates. And so, you know, what you want really depends a little bit on the details of the algorithm that you intend to run. Okay. So we absolutely need, need to deal with errors in some sense to be able to use one of these quantum processors for computation. And really, there are three basic schools of thoughts that people use on how to deal with errors. Um, one of them people talk about is NISC computing, noisy intermediate scale quantum computing. And it basically means, well, let's hope they're not too big. And let's try to pick problems where it's okay to have an answer that's a little bit wrong. Uh, lots of those problems are problems where people use the quantum processor to directly emulate another system. Uh, so for example, the um, non-abelian enions we talked about sort of fell into that. Didn't really matter if the energies weren't exactly right because you're interested in the qualitative behavior, not the exact quantitative outcomes. Um, the second thing that people talk about is called quantum error correction. You can take these devices, and I'm, I could spend an entire two or three hours talking about this, but basically you can use extra qubits called ancilla qubits to do parity checks between nearby neighbors to detect whether or not there have been bit flip or phase flip errors on them. And to me, th this is actually really cool because these are analog processors, right? All these gates are, you know, in principle, arbitrary unitaries. We can do small rotations. We can all do all kinds of weirdness. But the process of measuring those ancillas actually quantizes the errors. And so you take an analog processor and give it a digital error model, and then you can correct those errors digitally. And so it is an absolutely amazing piece of theory. Um, there have been demonstrations of quantum error correction that go maybe give you logical qubits that are just a tiny bit better than the physical qubits that they were made of, but they're on very small systems. And the reason is twofold. Um, these quantum error correcting codes have something called a threshold. There's a lot of gates involved in doing those parity checks and in measuring the parity. And if those gates are too bad, you actually do more harm than good by going through those operations. Um, and our quantum processors today, IBM's everyone's, they're just barely passing those thresholds now. Uh, the other reason is the overhead is quite high. People typically talk about encoding rates of one logical qubit per 100 or per 1,000 qubits. And so you need a very large quantum processor before you can pay that encoding rate and still do something useful. The third approach, um, sorry, those are the two I just talked about. We'll see this plot a couple of times today. I forgot I've included it. This is sort of a very cartoonish look at kind of the landscape of computation. We have some complexity of quantum circuit that we want to run. We have some simulation costs. You can think of that as cost and time or in money in the computers that you're buying, wall power if you're pa Pablo, maybe. Um, and you know, of course, as the circuit complexity grows, the classical cost of simulation grows exponentially. If I had a quantum error corrected uh, computer, the cost grows linearly with circuit complexity, but there's a huge threshold that we have to overcome yet because we need to meet these requirements on error rates and on number of qubits. There's this near term world of let's kind of hope we're okay anyway. Mm -hmm. And what most of this talk is going to be about is something a little bit different, which is called error mitigation. And it's based off of largely this paper from 2017, which outlines a couple of approaches to it. And the idea of error mitigation is instead of trying to make a fault tolerant quantum computer where we correct every error as they happen, let's somehow instead try to remove the bias from the quantum computer so that even in the presence of noise and in the presence of errors, we can extract accurate numbers. From it. That probably sounds a little bit like magic. And so kind of the next third of the talk is going to be going into a couple of the error mitigation techniques that um, are described. And so just to lay it out here before I go any further, all of these error mitigation techniques that are known today have exponential cost, right? So remember the advantage of the quantum computer was that we could simulate quantum circuits with polynomial complexity or polynomial cost. These were back on that same exponential curve that classical computers are on. However, it's going to turn out that we're on exponential curves with very, very, very small bases, uh, and basically proportional to error rate. And so the belief is that what these are going to do is give us a way to sort of smoothly interpolate from what we can do today up into error corrected quantum computers and get advantage on the path on the way there. But this is just a cartoon. Okay, so for my next kind of example, the first example will have a bare mitigation. Let's go to something that maybe hits this audience a little bit closer to the home. We're going to talk about simulating a 2D icing model. 
And we're going to use a very simple mapping here um, because, we, well, we want this to be easy for a quantum computer. We're interested in showing sort of short-term utility here. We're going to each use what, each one of our qubits to represent a single spin. We're going to have exchange couplings between the qubits just where they happen to be connected to our quantum processor anyway, because that lets us make the circuits very short and efficient. We're going to add a transverse magnetic field because we can do that with single qubit gates. This is a very simple model. Um, obviously, we know the ground state of this model, the time evolution of it. There's no computational proof of hardness, but it's not easy. What does it say? Um, these operators don't commute. And so if I just wanted to make the unitary operation that represented the time evolution of the system after some period of time t, well, that would be the same as solving the problem. I can't write that unitary down, and so I can't directly decompose it as a quantum circuit without effectively solving the problem first. And so the technique that people talk about using when they're talking about time evolution of systems like this is something called trotterization. What we're going to do is take those non-commuting observables, so we're just going to time evolve according to one of them for a very short period of time, and then the non-commuting ones and time evolve according to those for a very short -term period of time, and alternate back and forth between these. And so this actually looks a lot like a Newton's method integrator, right? That we're just gonna separate time into very, very short periods of time, do these little evolution snippets. Uh, it works out that you get an error in this that's proportional to the time step squared and the amount by which these operators don't commute. They are more, so, yes. Sorry, very good question. Is spin 20, 26 really just disconnected from the rest of the network? On this device it was. <laughs> <laughs> it was not supposed to be. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, this work was from four or five years ago. So our, our devices are a little bit better now, but you will still see things like that. Um, uh, can I just ask right How do you physically How do you physically cover the computing? So in these devices, we have a capacitive coupling between the qubits. Um, and so what that gives is basically an exchange interaction. So we get some splitting between the zero one and the one zero splits that states the qubit. Um, zero one. Yeah. So in our bare basis, we have zero, zero, one, one, zero, one, one, zero. We turn on this exchange interaction and we get some little splitting. You get kind of a dress. We did kind of address zero one down here and addressed one zero up here. Uh, and so each one of these things, if you just kind of think about first order perturbation theory, this looks like one zero plus some small amount of zero one. This looks like zero one minus some small amount of one zero. And so if I can drive these qubits in the bare basis, which means putting a microwave tone on just one specific qubit, then if I was in the zero one state, I can still drive, if I'm driving the left qubit, I can still cause the right qubit to rotate, but I cause it to rotate with a sign with a direction that depends on uh, whether you have that positive or negative sign there. And so you can get a conditional gate out of this. Uh, we call this gate cross resonance because you're driving one qubit at a nearby qubit's frequency, and you can use it to generate C naughts, for example. Um, but this is really specific to this particular device. It's not like every quantum computer is made that way. And in fact, our newer generation of devices doesn't use this gate anymore anyway but it's kind of a fun AMO physics -y sort of thing that you can walk through in 10 seconds. Yes. So we can't remember, we talked about the parallel, um, what gates you can run in parallel a moment ago on the all-to-all -all processors. It turns out there's a rule that for each qubit, we can only have it running one, two qubit gate at a time. These cross resonance gates don't commute with each other. And so although we want, say, this exchange operator and this exchange operator and this exchange operator, uh, we have to apply them sequentially. And so those color codes are just telling what the sequence of the gates applied in the actual circuit was. Very good eye, by the way. What starting state do you typically, would you typically be in with sign on? <laughs> this one was done with all the qubits started in the ground state because it's easy. Um, all of these uh, circuits that I'm going to be talking about today, they, they come from something we call our capabilities team. And so they're really designed to develop the capability to do things like, you know, doing time evolution of quantum states rather than to actually necessarily do anything interesting. Mm -hmm. So you're going to see this transverse field icing model starting from the ground state a lot. It's just sort of an easy bread and butter trial problem to use. Is there a starting state you would find interesting? Well, I, I mean... Do you just have every single state up? Hmm? 
you just use a uniform thermal to start out. That's what we typically do. Yeah. I mean, we could, in principle, prepare anything we wanted. I suppose we could prepare the eigenstates with the Hamiltonian, but it wouldn't be very interesting. Mm -hmm. Again, it, the actual evolution is not so much the point as opposed to what you can do with this. All right. So if you just naively run this circuit, and I apologize for the sort of horrible plot here, here's a picture of the total magnetization vector as a function of time as this guy evolves. In gray, we have the ideal trajectory because this is a 20 qubit system. We can trivially calculate that. And in blue, you can see what they got. And you can see <laughs> these don't agree. And we shouldn't have expected them to agree given the error rates that we were talking about. Now, they did two things to modify this experiment. One is they did some things they really should have started with and probably we don't want to talk about it in any detail. Uh, the first thing they did was they added this thing called dynamic decoupling. So basically they did Han echo on all the idle, idle qubits. It replaces T2 star with T2, makes the coherence times effectively longer. The second thing is something that will be important later. It's called polytoro. What they did is before each layer of the circuit, they actually changed the basis of all the qubits. So it may be that say at layer zero, I used the one state to mean plus C and the zero state to mean minus C. On the next layer of qubits, I'll just choose a random other orientation. Like I'm gonna now say plus X is plus, I'm gonna say that the X physical state of my qubit is now the plus C state of my logical state and so on. So just rotating the basis at every layer of the circuit. What that does is it randomizes the noise model. And so if I have any kind of systematic errors on the qubits, like imagine a qubit that slowly rotates counterclockwise, it, it turns it into a pure depolarizing channel. So it greatly simplifies the noise model. It turns a lot of errors that would otherwise accumulate quadratically into things that only accumulate linearly. This is a really standard trick in kind of quantum communications. And all that it involves is putting an extra layer of single qubit gates between each layer of the qubit. The next thing they did was sort of a horrible hack. Um, in this trotterization, as we make these uh, time steps small, we want to do two qubit gates that aren't full pi rotations. Uh, usually in quantum information science, people talk about gates like C naught that are a full pi rotation condition on it. They tuned up some smaller than pi rotations. So they tuned up gates like one one hundredth of a C naught gate. So they could do this trotter step exactly the native gate step of the device. Um, it's actually kind of ugly to have to do that in practice because tuning up continuous gate sets is annoying, but you know, they're kind of trying to eke out every advantage they do have. But this last one is what I really wanted to talk about. And this is the first of the air mitigation techniques I wanted to hit. And it's something called zero noise extrapolation. So let's imagine I have a quantum circuit and I can run it with some air rate E and it gives me an answer that's wrong, but it's close enough that I can linearize that answer in the error rate. And close enough that I can linearize the answer rate, uh, error rate, answer in the error rate is a huge loaded statement, admittedly. But let's just assume for that moment that's true. Then if I have a knob that I can use to turn the noise up and down, and I can run it again with say an error rate of one and a half E and two E and three E, I can make a plot of those and then I can extrapolate back down to zero error rate. Now, I kind of hope all of the experimentalists in the room are gonna get really mad at me now because there's a couple of really big problems with this technique. One is you have to have your error rate scale very accurately calibrated to do this extrapolation. You have to know exactly what your error rate was before you started. The other is that you have to have an knob that you know that will turn the error rate up and down continuously. Um, in this paper, what they did was something they call gate stretching. So normally all these two qubit gates and single qubit gates we implement with microwave pulses over some period of time. They made the pulses lower amplitude and they made the times longer. When they did that, all the errors because of qubit decoherence got a little bit larger, a little bit larger as they stretched it more and more and more. And then they extrapolated back to what the gate error would have been if the gates had been instantaneous. Uh, it sounds kind of good. It's a little tricky in practice because it turns out we also have errors that get bigger as the gates get shorter. Um, for example, self-heating with the control electronics, but also things like um, if you drive these duffling oscillators too hard, you eventually populate the two state. And so you have to very elegantly and poetically choose the range of gate widths over which you do this extrapolation, but you can get it to work. And when they put all three of these things together, you can see they went from an answer which was qualitatively very, very wrong to qualitatively pretty right. So this is sort of our first example of something that's less than full fault tolerance. How am I doing on time, by the way? Um, we have um, about 15 minutes. Okay, perfect. So, so 
one question. Which direction does the trajectory go in? Which is the starting point and the final point? So the starting the, the starting point was actually up here. This is the first experimental data point, I think. And you can see it spinning down towards the center of the sphere as the state gets more and more entangled and all the expectation values are going to the middle. Yes. A related question. I take it then this is being run for H greater than J, where we'd expect the magnetization to die. Yeah. Okay. Um, you, there will be a lot more data like this in a few slides, including some H sweeps. So um, hopefully that'll be interesting. Okay, so zero noise extrapolation is sort of one of the two air mitigation techniques that was laid out in this paper. There is another one that turns out to be a little bit trickier to implement in practice that was also laid out at the same time that was called probabilistic air correction. Uh, it has some kind of different properties, um, but the basic picture of it is that we're going to take our circuit and instead of systematically trying to stretch the noise, we're going to insert additional gates and we're going to actually try to invert the noise model of the processor. So we're going to try to probabilistically add gates that are going to exactly cancel the noise. Um, there, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I, I want, I'm waiting to see if anyone says, but the inverse of a noise model isn't physical. Okay, I'm gonna say it, but the inverse of a noise model isn't physical. <laughs> and so we have to play some really crazy tricks to get this to work. And so that's kind of the second example that I wanted to use. So let's talk about a really toy example of this probabilistic error correction to see how it plays out in practice. And in particular, I'm going to talk about trying to use probabilistic error correction to correct for what we would call a T1 error, the fact that our qubit's amplitude decays over a function of time. And so the noise model for this T1 error is pretty simple at each time step with a probability of one minus my error rate, the qubit does nothing. And with a probability, probability proportional to my error rate, it gets a pi flip, it decays. Okay, so this is my noise channel that I'm going to try to invert. As I said before, the inverse of this is not physical. The reason is this noise map is going to take my um, states out on the surface of the block sphere and they're going to collapse them down to a point. There is no physical process that makes, you know, makes um, state spaces larger. So we already know out of the box, we cannot do this. But nonetheless, let's make an ansatz. I'm going to try applying a uh, inverse noise model now in air quotes, where with some probability one minus Q, I'm going to do nothing. And with a probability Q, I'm going to pi flip the qubit. So when I carry this through at each time step, and I'm discretizing time here because our gates have a finite duration. And so kind of Krauss operators is a nice way to look at this. With the probability of one minus Q times one minus P, I don't do anything, no decay happens, I get the right answer. With a probability P times Q, I get a decay and I flip the qubit and I get the right answer. But there's two cases, this one minus Q times P and Q times one minus P where either I flipped the qubit when I shouldn't have or the qubit decayed and I didn't flip it. And so if I want to make the circuit perfect, all that I have to do is make sure that one minus Q times P plus Q times one minus P is zero. Easy. You do a little bit of algebra, you solve this, you find out Q, the probability that I flip it, just be minus P over one minus two P. So for example, if I had a 10% chance of T1 decay with a probability of about minus 10%, I should pi flip the qubit. We went and asked some interns to do this. They came back after a couple of weeks, told us it was hard. <laughs> no, th this is what's non-physical about this noise model. We cannot do things with a negative 10% probability. However, if we limit ourselves, instead of to getting the right answer about our quantum cuter, getting correct expectation values, we actually can do that. And the way that we do this is instead of looking at any individual output of our quantum computer, we look at the weighted average of them. And so what we're going to do is on the circuits where I added a pi flip, we're going to add them with a weight of minus one. On the circuits where I didn't, I'm going to add them with a weight of plus one. And then the expectation value that I get out of this is going to be the same as the expectation value that I would have gotten had I been able to include these negative probabilities. So this kind of brings us to the biggest actually limitation of all of these air mitigation techniques that we know about today. It was one that was sort of implicit in the zero noise extrapolation where I talked about extrapolating an observable back. It's very explicit here. I can correct expectation values. If what you care about out of your circuit is say the expectation value of some magnetization or some correlator between different electronic states, these kinds of techniques work. 
If what you care about are the individual shots out of the circuit, which is, for example, what you need for Shor's algorithm, unfortunately, these techniques don't work. They only work for thermodynamic averages. Um, that includes a lot of interesting problems. It includes the QAOA, uh, sorry, the BQE that we started with. It includes QAOA. It includes things like time evolution of state vectors. Um, it does not include a lot of the problems in discrete math that are people interested in. It doesn't include things like rover search. So it's a limitation. So um, this is just saying that in a little bit different way. Um, because of those minus signs, when I do my weighted average, it's going to turn out that I'm going to have an overall weighting factor. I'm going to have to divide by something that depended on how many minus signs and how my weighted average versus how many of my plus signs were. Because I added some minus signs, it's always less than one. So what I'm going to be doing is whatever expectation value I compute after this weighted average, I'm going to be dividing it by a number. So I'm going to be blowing it up a little bit. And that kind of makes sense because as my state decays more and more and more, I'm effectively kind of increasing the size of the blocks here out again. Yeah. That is another way of saying exactly what I was just getting to. Um, that when you include these minus signs and then you divide by this weighting factor, the variance of your distribution blows up. And so to get the same accuracy answer that you would have had had you not used this technique, there's a sampling overhead associated with it. And it's going to work out, um, the sampling overhead is basically proportional in the product of the error rates on all of your qubits. And so it's exponential in the average error rate uh, of your device times the number of gates that you want to run. And that's where the exponential overheads in these techniques come from. But again, remember that the base of this exponent is some number very close to one, and how close it is to one depends on the average error rate of my device. So this is something that we can work on physically by making our devices better and better and better. That was a great observation. Okay, so this was the toy model. How do we do this in practice on a more complicated circuit? Uh, we're going to, instead of running our circuit once, we're going to average over many, many instances where we're going to introduce, this is supposed to be animated. I'm going to blame Zoom just like Pablo did. Um, we're going to insert um, at different points of the circuit these optional pi pulses for T1 decay. Uh, it turns out if you're going to do this accurately, you need a complete noise model. So you actually need to measure all the different ways that your quantum computer could be wrong and insert the exact inverse of that. And I'm going to average over many such circuits and then calculate the mitigated expectation values. So for a real world, world implementation, I'm going to divide my circuit into layers. Here are these U's. Those are those same colored layers of C0 gates that you noticed in our earlier trying, uh, earlier uh, trotterization. Each one of those layers is going to have some multi-qubit noise model associated with it. That noise model has a ridiculous number of parameters. Uh, in most general cases, it's two to the number of qubits. So obviously, we cannot measure that and still claim any kind of advantage. But what we're going to do is assume that the noise is local. So we're going to assume that, for example, a qubit might decay, or maybe there will be some unwanted interaction between pairs of qubits. But a qubit at one corner of our device isn't going to cause something to happen at the other corner of the device. And this is physically motivated. And it's another one of the limitations of this technique that if things like that aren't true, you can't do this. Uh, we learn these noise models by something called air amplification. Basically, we apply the same series of gates over and over and over again. And we actually look for the eigenvectors of that unitary and we look at the way that that case. And so from that, you can fit these noise coefficients. Then we apply these probabilistic gates. Um, now, one question that usually comes up at this point is, well, okay, but applying those gates themselves adds noise because the gates that you're using are themselves noisy. And this is where that twirling gets really important. Because each one of these layers is already twirled, there's already a single qubit gate in front of and behind it. And so what we can actually do is take these probabilistic gates and absorb them into the twirl. So it changes which single qubit gate we're applying, but it doesn't actually add or subtract a gate. And so under the third assumption now, the assumption that all of the single qubit gates have the same noise model, this is an absolutely fine thing to do. So here's a extremely toy example of doing this. Here we're looking at a circuit with a layer of two C naughts. So basically we do an XOR between all the pairs of qubits, kind of the classical equivalent, and then we do it a second time to make an identity operation. And so at the end of the day, the expectation value should just be all ones. And here we're looking at what I would call different weights of Z operators. Um, you might call it correlations between the spins of the different spins on the lattice. So at the far left, we're looking at the probability of the Z expectation value of one of these spins pointing in the plus Z direction. 
There were a couple of different ones chosen at random. Here we're looking at, say, the joint probability of 32 of them all pointing in the plus C direction. Because this was the identity circuit, all these correlators should be one. You can see without PC, and this decays to zero very quickly. And that's just because basically the probability of getting this right is the product of the probability of all the individual qubits that went into that correlator. With PEC, you can see that it stays near one. Okay. So um, I'm going to hit one last technique because this is actually the one that in practice we're finding is the most efficient right now. And I apologize for all the acronyms. If you're at a company called IBM, you have to turn everything into an acronym. Um, and this is a really non-intuitive one. We call this probabilistic error amplification. And it's the combination of the two techniques that I just talked about before. You'll recall that to do this probabilistic error correction, I had to very accurately model the noise in my device. In fact, I had to model it so well that I could effectively run the inverse of that noise model. But what if I got rid of all of those minus signs? And so now, instead of deliberately making the noise smaller, I'm going to deliberately amplify it a little bit. Now I can do a trick very much like zero noise extrapolation, where I can extrapolate back to zero noise. But I have two big advantages. One is this x-axis is now spectacularly well calibrated because I measured my noise model to start with. And the other is because the rate at which I add the noise is just proportional to all these probabilities, I can add tiny amounts of additional noise. And so I can really get a very dense series of points on the x-axis and make this extrapolation back to zero noise quite accurate. It has the advantage that the sampling overhead is in principle smaller than it is with PC. We no longer have all those minus signs floating around. It has the disadvantage that it really rests on this very untestable approximation that your noise is small enough at the beginning of the circuit that you can extrapolate back to zero noise and only have these linear terms. Um, so that is the technique that was used in this paper that was just out a couple of weeks ago, actually. And this, to me, was kind of an exciting paper, um, not because it did anything interesting computationally in and of itself, but because it was a demonstration of running a quantum circuit that provides accurate estimates of observables at the end of the circuit that approaches and actually passes the end of what we can do exactly computationally on a classical computer. So this is not in and of itself a useful result, but it is, I think, pretty solid proof that even though we have pre-fault tolerant computers, we cannot run error correcting codes yet, we can actually use quantum computers to provide accurate answers, uh, at least in limited circumstances. So I said we'd be seeing a lot of icing models. This was a transverse icing model on 127 qubit lattice. Um, this is the circuit that was being run, just because it's kind of fun to show it. And it's the exact same one that we saw in that 27 qubit paper, that we have some X rotations for the transverse magnetic field, and we have these layers of two qubit gates for the exchange operation. Now, it, if you look at the details of the circuit for a moment, you'll notice these are pi over two. And this is kind of one of the caveats that we have to talk about on the circuit is there's, um, remember we have these non-commuting operators that we're doing this trotterization of. They've chosen a trotter step in this that corresponds exactly to our native two qubit gate. So at each trotter step, they apply an X rotation to, for the transverse magnetic field. And then they do a complete 180 degree rotation for the exchange operator, right? And so this is an incredibly <laughs> coarse trotter step. It's not accidental. That was picked so that they could get entanglement spread across the device as quickly as possible to really stack the deck kind of in favor of the quantum computer being able to do something useful. Useful. Um, but if you imagine doing a certain dense matter simulation, you have to realize that they did play that trick in practice. If you wanted a real answer out, you would need to use a much smaller trotter step than you're using in this work. So here's an example of some of the data that they took. So here, this x-axis is your transverse magnetic field H. The y-axis is the magnetization, total magnetization, again, of everything that we see here. <laughs> and you can see there's some decay of the magnetization as you turn up that magnetic field. Um, the green data points here show the unmitigated data, so none of those techniques being applied, and the blue data points show mitigated. Now, the zero and pi over two cases are kind of special. Uh, it turns out for those particular choices of magnetic field for the size of trotter step they chose, this is a Clifford circuit, which is efficiently simulatable. And so if you do that, you can actually recover those two endpoints. But 
even simpler. Um, this is a 127 qubit device, but this was only after 15 trotter steps. And so there's a light, light cone simplification that you can make. That some of the parts of the device were so far away that they simply couldn't matter to the outcome that they were measuring. And so you can exactly simulate this. And we have some partners at Berkeley that helped us out doing these exact simulations. So this gives us some confidence that our zero noise extrapolation in this case is giving us the right answers. So, so yes. By exact simulation, you mean as if there were no, was no noise? As if there was no noise. And that is a very good point. And so this is sort of the second caveat of this paper. Uh, we're comparing our quantum circuit that's simulating a transverse icing model to simulations of that quantum circuit, not to simulations of the transverse icing model. So we're sort of forcing someone to simulate our own quantum computer. And it, it is a legitimate criticism of this work. Now, if, yes. Uh, well, I mean, linear is the lowest order approximation. You can show that in general, it should be extra exponential in fact. Okay. Exponential in the sense of, um, yeah, like this, right? So we're just taking the very beginning of that exponential. Um, my general attitude towards this is if you're doing this extrapolation and it matters what function you use to extrapolate it with, you probably shouldn't be doing it. Um, but the, you see in the literature people going to this more robust, or say more exciting extrapolation quite routinely. Okay, so if we sort of tied our collaborators' hands behind our back and we said, let's pretend you didn't have a very good classical computer and you had to use an approximate technique to simulate this, they did look at the exact same problem with the tensor network and a matrix product simulation. And unsurprisingly, as they go to these very large transverse magnetic fields, you start to see those approximations break down. Okay. However, we can kind of turn up the heat a little bit in a couple of different ways. One thing that we can do is we can make the light cone larger. And to do that, instead of looking at the magnetization of a single qubit in the left center of the lattice, we can look at some product of magnetization scattered about. Because remember, we can look at any expectation value we'd like to. So here we're looking at the correlation between the magnetization of this little cluster of qubits out here. That makes those light cone simulations harder to do. Uh, it's still possible to do it. And you can see, you know, with this higher weight observable, we still end up agreeing with the uh, exact theory quite well. And again, we see the matrix product state in the tensor network um, approach starting to break down here. Uh, we can get even more extreme and sample larger portions of the lattice. And you can see our error bars are getting a little bit bigger, but we're getting farther and farther away from these approximate techniques. But it's still a little bit uncompelling because we're still simulating something that we can exactly classically simulate. So the final thing that we can do is to increase the depth of our circuit enormously, or we can look at much, much higher weight observables that basically make these light cone, ops, uh, um, light cone simplification start work. And at this point, we're comfortably beyond what can be exactly simulated with a classical computer, even using those light cone simulations. And you can see that we're still getting data that at these magical points of pi over two and zero, agree with what we know that they should be from Clifford circuit simulation, um, but we're now beyond the exact classical simulation. Uh, the tensor network methods and the matrix product state methods that our collaborators were trying, we're not converging to the same things as the quantum computer we're saying at this point. Yes? So can you do other classical methods that are not, not a tensor product? That is a great question. Um, so we published this paper. Um, by the way, these are the authors on it who uh, did a great job of taking all the data. Within a week of publishing this paper, uh, Pablo's <laughs> flurry of theory started to happen again. And in fact, um, yeah, this slide should actually already be updated since I only made this on Friday before I came. Um, there are four additional papers simulating this exact system using additional techniques ranging from just sort of physically oriented, only simulating subsections of the lattice to more sophisticated simulation techniques. I'm not an expert in this particular field, so I'm not going to try to tell you what they are. And so two kind of great things come out of this. One is these better simulations agreed with the experimental data. And so this is more evidence that we're getting the correct answer, pre-fault tolerance, but beyond what is exactly classically simulatable. And the other kind of fun thing is all of these fall within the error bars of our data. 
And so the disagreement between these different approximate methods is actually still approximately equal to the experimental error on this. So I'm personally super excited about this because this is evidence that we can get accurate numbers out of quantum computer pre-fault tolerance that we cannot compute exactly with a classical computer. And, you know, as time continues to go on, I'm sure there will continue to be back and forth as we add more qubits, as we continue to reduce the error rates, and as people find better classical ways of simulation. Hopefully, at some point, we'll do something that's not the transverse icing model. By the way, this plots in that paper if you want to find it. The, the photo's fine. I just thought I'd mention it. <laughs> um, hopefully, at some point, we'll do something that's not a transverse icing model, or even better, perhaps someone else will do something that's not a transverse icing model with one of our processors. Because at the end of the day, we don't make these things for ourselves to use. We make them for other people to use. So, um, and just to throw it in there, because um, we had a little bit of data on Quantinium's processor, just for reference, this was done with an Eagle R3 processor. It had an average two qubit error rate of about 1%, um, about 1%, an average single qubit error rate of a few times 10 to the minus four. These are just cumulative density plots for the different error rates on the device. Um, not so important as far as what the exact numbers are. Now, I, I did say I thought that this was going to continue to be a real back and forth as we reduced our error rate. I'm feeling really confident about that, actually. Um, part of the reason is that on isolated qubits, so not yet integrated in these large devices, uh, I mentioned this last night in passing, we're now getting T1s of up to four milliseconds in superconducting qubits. That's an order of magnitude larger than what was used in this demonstration. And so it really says at least it's physically possible for us to push the system to error rates that are an order of magnitude smaller than what we were talking about there. That means instead of those 65 trotter steps, we'd be talking about 650 trotter steps. And that's where things maybe start to get a little bit exciting. The other reason is, and I did talk about this briefly last night, so I apologize for anyone that's there. We actually have a new processor coming up that's not based off of that cross resonance gate we discussed briefly earlier. It's based off of a tunable coupler, so we can actually turn on and off the interaction between the qubits. And the median error rate on this processor is actually better than the best error rate on our previous processor. Now, I suspect not a lot of people are used to reading these normal quantile plots. Um, this is a cumulative distribution function of the error rates across this device, where the x-axis has been now mapped to an inverse error function. And so the kind of magic of doing that is if you have a, we use these a lot in kind of the semiconductor field. If you have a normal distribution, it should make a nice straight line. If you have something that's not normal, it makes a not nice straight line. And so you can see for our previous processors, the error rates were more or less normal. For this new one, you see something really funny, <laughs> that it's normal up to a point, and then there's this tail of absolutely horrible gates. And I probably shouldn't see happy about that, but it actually turns out to be a really interesting piece of physics. Um, most of the decoherence in these devices comes from something that we somewhat ironically call two-level systems, so little microscopic defects with two energy levels. They have sort of continuum of energy. They're really well known from um, acoustic absorption in glasses. Uh, they have really neat and cool fingerprints as a function of temperature and frequency and everything else that you would care to uh, measure. Uh, in our qubits in particular, though, there are a couple of places where the electric fields become very strongly co uh, concentrated. They become very con strongly concentrated, in particular near the Joseph junction, where the two electrodes get close together. If you happen to have one of those two-level systems right there in that field concentration area with the exact same frequency as your qubit, it absolutely destroys the qubit performance. In fact, in extreme cases, you can actually see it exchange oscillations between the qubit and these individual TLSs. And so, you know, was, at the time we said, well, this is probably those resonant exchange interactions with TLS is happening. So we dropped the error rates a little bit. We've gotten much more sensitive to it. And someone in our lab performed sort of a tour de force experiment. They took one of these devices and they warmed it up and they cooled it down and they warmed it up and they cooled it down and they warmed it up and they cooled it down 30 different times. And they measured all these two, all these different two different two qubit error rates 30 different times. And what they saw is on any given cool down, the different colors are different cool downs. One of these two qubit gates might be awful, indicating it has one of these TLSs resonantly interacting with it. But on other cool downs, it would be absolutely fine. And actually, on any particular cycle of this device, about 10% of the gates had sort of left the clan, uh, if you will. So it's kind of a fun piece of physics, but it also gives me another source of hope in that this is a really well-documented phenomenon in the uh, community. 
And in particular, there are ways that are known to tune the TLS frequencies. You can do it with strain on the device. You can do it with electric fields. You can also come in with radiation, say, and randomize them. And so we've made some additional devices where we're able to use those tuning techniques. What we've been able to do is actually take our two qubit error rate and really flatten the distribution. So those really horrible high flyers are out there. So this is something we're going to be coming out with probably in two or three years. Yes. Yes. Is it also possible to design with negativity so you just avoid those states? That so big? Yeah, I mean, the, the missing coupler on that first device to talk about is sort of an example of that. Um, we do have a long-term goal that we want to run error correcting codes on these devices, and those typically require very specific connectivities to implement these parity checks. So although for a case where you're really just using this to run arbitrary unities, yes, of course, you can work around a missing link by kind of swapping around it or something. But if your goal is in the long term to efficiently implement these error correcting codes, you really want every link to work as perfectly as you can. Um, the other thing to realize is even today, these P, C, and Z and E techniques that are exponential in error rate, um, they're exponential in the product of all of the error rates, actually. And so you're hugely sensitive to the worst qubit on the device. And anything that you can do to make that worst error better is an enormous benefit. Okay. So, and this is sort of a little bit of a teaser, kind of where we think we're going to be going. Um, we really want to use PC and to be able to provide a tool to the community, which includes you guys, that's able to accurately estimate observables on a circuit that's 100 qubits wide and 100 gates deep by the end of 2024. And we think that's pretty comfortably in the range where possibly, you know, how many qualifiers can I add? You can go beyond these toy icing models and start to do real computation on these devices. So Look, there, there's lots of interesting physics in these devices. There's the physics of the qubits themselves, the way that they couple. You know, there's this entire field of quantum circuit and electrodynamics. There's the physics that you can do by using these to directly emulate quantum states. Um, but this talk has really been about something different, which is about using these circuits to directly do computations on physical systems, to directly simulate chemistry, to directly simulate condensed matter systems, because that's long-term where I think everyone wants these devices to go. And we are beyond the exactly simulatable limit and still producing accurate expectation values. There are still approximate methods that are competitive with what we can do on these devices, but they're continuing to get better. And I think we're going to be past that stage very soon. And so I think that we're entering the point where these devices are going to become important computationally as opposed to just interesting physical systems in and of themselves. And I think that's really all I had to say. Oh, I mean, just for yeah, uh, just for fun. Okay, so um, yeah, you've stuck to your brief. We actually have time for questions. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um. So to correct it, the bit, the 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 gap in the T one that I mean by those two blocks, right? But then it's kind of one way, right? It goes from a static block, so can you correct that? Yeah, so um, that's one of those little um, hiccups that's fixed by the poly twirling. Um, so T1 in our devices not only goes from the excited state to the ground state because they usually decay. Um, they're actually at finite temperature. If you look really carefully, you'll see they don't quite T1 decay to the ground state. They decay to a few percent higher than that. But because we're randomly changing the base system to qubit on every instruction, that decay becomes something that on average goes to the middle of the block sphere. Yes. Yeah, thanks. I wondered if I could ask a bit further about sort of why techniques like MPS are doing badly at the unmagnetized end. And in some sense, there's a duality between those two sides, right? So is it because the excitations in the high transverse field side are non-local in terms of the excitations in the low I field side? I 100% the wrong person to ask that. Um, the excitation, well, let me try a little bit. The, the excitations are actually always quite localized in this system. Um, that it, just because of the small number of trotter steps that we're taking here, there, there is not time for them to have traveled very far away from kind of their point of origin. And in fact, one of these approximate lines that I pointed out, um, this is kind of my favorite, this one that's just labeled 31 qubit. Um, what they did is they simulated a cloud of 31 qubits chosen around the point of the observable being measured exactly. So there was support for the light count out of that cloud, but they just said, well, probably the excitation is still pretty local. 
and it turns out to work really amazingly well. It, it says that we really do need to look at circuits that spread the entanglement a little bit more quickly. Um, as for the detailed uh, excitation structure, I'm really not the right person. Yeah. It was a more philosophical question, the meaning of errors. So let's say I'm interested in finding a useful solution of a problem. I have a physics theory that has a model, and as a plain theorist, I would like to solve exactly this model or exactly this solution. Mm -hmm. But we know that the model is usually approximated to reality itself. So couldn't I see the errors in your computer as the environment as we know it? So in the sense of if I want to predict the limit of the weather or chemical reactions, there are things in my model that in principle I didn't account for. Uh, that could be errors, hopefully that so in the sense of utility, are there errors in any way like reality uh in second the model? Yeah. So um, maybe a tangential way to come about that. One thing that you see people doing a lot with these near-term computers is simulating open quantum systems, because then the decoherence of the processor essentially becomes part of your simulation. And you know the, the space that you need to worry about for an open quantum system where you have an entire density matrix as opposed to a state vector is computationally even harder uh, than just a state vector in and of itself. I those simulations are usually a little bit touchy because we typically don't have wonderful control over the decoherence in our devices. And so it's not that you picked the exact degree of openness, the exact error model that you would like for simulation, but you kind of got stuck with whatever my device had. Um, one interesting area of research that I know is going on right now is people are using this probabilistic error amplification to tune the noise model of the device. And so by inserting random gates, they're effectively putting Krauss operators into their circuit to add the exact amount of decoherence that they would like, and then trying to use these to simulate those open quantum systems more precisely. So yes, I, I think it's actually very interesting to talk about that kind of thing. It does sort of, start of skirt the line between using the device as a computational tool and using the device to simulate itself, though, which you know is the touchy area in the field right now. Is that more or less? Yeah. Hmm? Um, is it useful at all to distinguish the type of error where you still have a pure state at the end, but it's not, not just the one you wanted, mm -hmm. and the type of error, as you were mentioning, where at the end you don't have a pure state because it's coupled to the environment? Those errors are different. They're very different. Um, in particular, if you imagine applying an identity gate repeatedly, uh, if I have one of these incoherent errors, the air qubit is coupled to the environment, the probability of an error increases linearly as I apply the gate over and over again. Um, on the other hand, imagine a small unitary error, for example, a small X rotation that I didn't intend. Uh, as I apply that gate repeatedly, the errors actually accumulate quadratically. Right? We're beginning to see the start of a Rabi oscillation. And so you can get much worse than expected performance in the face of those unitary errors. That's one of the reasons why this poly twirling is really important, because it effectively kind of caps the unitary error at the end of one evolution, and then you choose a new basis that becomes incoherent compared to what it was previously. Uh, if you don't do that poly twirling, you can see very strange things in these devices if the gates aren't calibrated perfectly, and they never are. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. You mentioned that you can uh, do mid process measurements mm -hmm. that extends the class of computation you can do. Um, uh, of course, that's not equivalent to a unitary transformation anymore. It's, mm -hmm. it's got projections or something inside it. So can you say a bit more about that? Um, let's see here. So um, we typically talk about these as dynamic circuits. Is that the little dial? The little dial thing? Yeah, so this little dial means I take a qubit and I measure its state and I put it into a classical register someplace off to the side. Yes. Uh, and in the case of dynamic circuits, did you reset it or leave it in the state you measured it? You can do either. Um, there's so one of the kind of things people really like to have in these processors is something that's called a quantum non demolition measurement. So the idea that when you do a measurement that should be projective and leave the qubit in the state that you measured it in, mm -hmm. as opposed to, for example, destroying the qubit, launching it off into the stratosphere, or causing it to decay, all kinds of horrible things can and do happen in practice. Um, our devices are pretty good on that QNDness score, but you're in practice a little bit better off if you reset it afterwards. Yeah, we're not perfect. 
So sorry for the kind of long answer to a simple question. I, I, I might think about the measurement as being swapping it with an ancillary qubit or how should I think about it? Um, so for I'm going to answer that by telling you specifically how we do it on our devices because there are many different ways to measure the different types of qubits. Mm -hmm. For our device, there's actually an exchange coupling between our qubit and a nearby linear resonator. Mm -hmm. It's actually a microwave transmission line. Mm -hmm. And so because of that exchange coupling, there's a little dispersive shift of the frequency of that resonator depending on the state of the, free, the qubit. Mm -hmm. um, normally, that doesn't really do anything. You can flip the qubit around however you like, and the frequency of that resonator goes up and down. Um, but what we can do is come in with a microwave probe tone that will have a phase shift depending on the exact frequency of that resonator. And by doing that, we can measure the frequency of the resonator, and then dephase and measure the state of the qubit. Um, it's ideally a non-demolition process, although if you put too many photons into that measurement resonator, all kinds of higher order processes come into play, and you can really mess up your quantum device. So um by putting it into some other exciting state that it's never yeah. to do with your yeah our qubits aren't really qubits they're these stopping oscillators and so yeah. it's got all kinds of higher energy states that you just don't want to play with in practice okay so you can measure some subset of the uh, qubits and then you can act upon them and there are i'm mostly going to give you references here i apologize for this um, there's lots of interesting things you can do that um, one of them we heard an ex interesting example of on monday is that you can effectively, well, here, maybe let me start out with the simplest example. You um, you can use quantum teleportation, for example, right? They remember, in quantum teleportation, I make a Bell state, I spread it across my device. In this case, I would mean swapping it across the device, and then I can measure one state in the Bell pair. And uh, sorry, I can entangle one of those with a third qubit, which has to be there. And then I can measure the one next to that third qubit, and that tells me what classical operation I need to perform on the other half of the bell pair to instantaneously teleport that qubit across the device. So this is a resource that we can use during these computations to quickly move information around, but it requires that you're able to do that correctly. Um, okay, thank you. That's very interesting. Yeah, so it's kind of hopefully a simpler example everyone's kind of aware of. Um, there's lots of quantum algorithms that are based on something called repeated until success. You sort of rotate the gate by a little bit, by a little, the qubit by a little bit, by a little bit, by a little bit. You keep on testing some condition on it, and eventually you succeed, and then you call yourself done. Um, there are some proofs that you can implement Clifford's in constant depth. I'm not going to try to walk through those. I'm sorry. But they basically involve creating a little bit of entanglement across the entire thing you can get you'd like to run your circuit on, and then doing kind of internal teleportation within that. And then finally, a lot of the kind of absolutely classic quantum information science algorithms like uh, iterative phase estimation involve the ability to measure a state over and over and over again, kind of different trial phases. So, and actually, iterative phase estimation is kind of a fun example because you can write it as a very short sample program. So, sorry for a little bit of a non answer there. It's, it's a huge literature. Although, I do want to emphasize again, computationally, all of these are equivalent to that circuit model that we started to without measurement, which is to say, with polynomial overhead, I can take any circuit with mid-circuit mid measurement and map it back into a just plain old normal quantum circuit. But polynomial overheads matter a lot today. Yes? So if you don't have to, so you may be a record for these two level systems, right? So if you find any go and wait to the two, no way they are to do all of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so um, let me answer that two different ways. Uh, in addition to the qubit itself, which is just, we talk about its decoherence, which is kind of how quickly it loses information when it's just sitting there. We have a couple of big sources of error. Uh, one is residual interactions between the qubits that we didn't intend to be there. In the cross-resonance devices, that's absolutely always there because there's an always-on coupling between the qubits. And so the frequency of every qubit depends very weakly on the state of every other qubit in the lattice. And the way that we make those devices work by making that dependence or all the couplings weak enough that we can refocus those frequency shifts away. Uh, even in our tunable coupler devices, you know, these are controlled by real electrical currents and those currents have noise. And so we can never turn that coupling completely off. Uh, beyond that, our single qubit operations are, at the end of the day, microwave pulses. Those pulses have phase errors, they have amplitude errors, they have frequency drifts, they have all the horrible things that happen in the real world. 
And all those turns into er turn into errors on the exact axis and angles of our rotations. And so even if we had a perfect qubit, our operations are imperfect. And I think for any of the quantum systems that people are talking about, whether you want to talk about spin qubits or trapped ions or superconducting qubits, ultimately the precision of the classical electronics that we know how to make today is going to limit all of those to error rates that are really realistically not much better than 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6, someplace in that factor of 100 range. Um, the other, other half of that answer, by the way, the TLS bath itself is actually kind of cool. The, the traditional TLS model is that you actually have some exactly degenerate two-level system with some weak breaking of that degeneracy by disorder. And so you end up with a continuum of different energies because of this distorter potential. Um, in practice, what that means is when you have these high-frequency TLSs that come over qubits, there's also a bath of very low-frequency TLSs that can be thermally excited that are electrostatically coupled to those. And so this entire thing just slowly shifts around in kind of a glassy mess. It's kind of fascinating, actually. Um, yeah. Just one thing to test for You seem to have many of these devices now. So have you tried running any of these error corrected things on multiple devices and see how well they do? So not yet. Um, the, the amazing thing is, despite having many of our devices, they're always busy. Uh, in fact, it's a point of frustration within our team that <laughs> part of the reason why this work was able to be able to be written is that that group of people got exclusive access to one of these processes okay. for almost six months to debug the process and to take the data. Uh, it would be a very expensive experiment to run. Now, there is sort of an interesting hypothetical on all these um, error mitigation techniques that one way you can randomize over error models would be to run the same experiment on multiple processors and then average those answers together. Yeah. And so beyond a cross-check, is this actually a way of getting a more accurate answer yeah, faster? Yeah. Um, our financial bosses love that idea because then you can talk about selling multiple processors to the same person. <laughs> and so it's sort of a trivial parallelization. Um, in practice, I think it's probably easier to make the error rates better. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So this is a fairly uh, non-scientific question, but do you have any insight uh, whether IBM plans to give access to the scientific community to these machines uh, indefinitely, or is there a cutoff when they will expect, you know, if a university wants to use a quantum computer even a small one, they have to pay. Um, so just, I, I haven't wanted to talk about this because it kind of goes a little bit commercial. Currently we provide um, free access to a lot of our smaller systems, kind of the five and the seven qubit ones to really anyone, um, not just the scientific community. Um, that's sort of starting to break down because the wait times have gotten so long of those systems that it's kind of impractical for people to really play and learn on them anymore, which was really the purpose of providing that. It's also had a very perverse effect that most of the papers written using our devices are written using our forced devices because those are the free one. And so we are looking at revamping that model. Um, there is nothing official yet. And um, but the, the plan is to continue to provide that access, to, but to find try to find a way to provide that access to the better systems. And so I think it'll be a plus. Um, the other thing I will point out is that we provide access, paid access to a lot of government labs and a lot of universities. And a lot of the time when I've been talking to people after a little bit of digging, we found out they actually already had paid access to available to the system through a route that they didn't even realize. And so if you're interested, you know, please let's do that digging and see if you already have it. I think that's a good place to end on and have some lunch. So that's not knowledge or what